been in Indian realities. So we are going, this is an Novo sponsored lecture. So we are, will be talking about what is the difference between Indian versus the Western counterpart and what innovation will help us and what are the real world data on this. So we Indians are obviously different from the Western counterparts. If you'll see here, this is from the uh, review and here you will see that microvascular complication nephropathy, retinopathy, we have higher, but peripheral neuropathy, we have lower. That is because of our lower height and the vascular disease, we have higher cardiovascular with a lower peripheral vascular disease. So uh, this, this was published, uh, the pure study was uh, from Dr. Uh, one of the author was Dr. Vimon, various countries were involved. Here it was regarding the white rice intake, it, uh, almost more than 1,32,000 patients were involved in this and it showed that the incidence of diabetes, risk of uh, diabetes increased between somewhere between 2% to 40% and it was highest in the Indian and lowest in the Chinese. So it was almost zero in the Chinese. Another study, this SARS study, this was in the five regions of India with almost 800 uh, patients involved with 10 specialists involved and here they have seen that uh, a few of the centers were from MP as well. So here it showed that overall the carb intake in our population is somewhere around 60 to 70 percent and there is data which shows up to 80, 85 percent also our diet actually contains of carb. So we Indians actually consume more carb, that's the problem and that is why this PPG, that postprandial rise is much higher and we may not be that benefited with a just initiation of a basal insulin. That is how we came with this co-formulation thing. Okay, and this study, uh, everybody of you must have seen the Munir site which showed that the higher HBNC, when you go beyond 9%, all those, it's the fasting which actually impacts more the HBNC and there is a study which shows that lower uh, it lower end it's the PP which influences more. But here you will see in, this is from the Asian population. Here you will see it, this is actually uh, from the China Taiwan study, and this shows that even at the lower HBNC, our PP contribution is much higher for that HBNC versus the Munia study, which at the lower somewhere around 6.57, it was the PP, but at the higher, more than 9%, 7%, it was the PP. That is how the concept of FFF, first fixed fasting, came, okay? So this is about the Indian realities, high carb intake, I've already told you, we Asian phenotypes have a, initially, like, a decade earlier we have diabetes, we have complication. A uh, decade earlier our waist hip ratio is higher, visceral obesity is higher, insulin resistance is higher, okay? And delayed in insulin therapy, I believe that's almost a problem here because of the inertia by the patient as well as the doctors because they are not very confident to start. And let's not talk about just initiation. It's about the titration and intensification. So almost that also is delayed. If you see the data, almost like one in four patient actually, or one in three patient actually have a good glycemic control in India. All those studies are there. Our average HBNC is somewhere between eight to 9%. And even those patients who are on insulin, only one fourth of them actually have a good glycemic control. That means that well within the target for most of our a population it would be less than 7% HBNC. So we have these problems, we have high carb diet, high PPG levels and patients on multiple drugs is still not, there's inertia to initiate insulin and we need those insulin which are very simple and convenient to up titrate. That is also important. Not only to initiate, up titrate is also something we needed. So what the guideline says, if you'll see the guideline AC, ADA and IDF all says that you have to initiate with the basal insulin initially or the earlier version said that you can initiate with the premix but when you come to this RSSDI ESI conscientious 2019, here you will see you can initiate with a basal or a premix, both are okay. So the basic of initiation, either you can initiate with a basal you can initiate with a premix or you can initiate with a basal bolus. Everyone has its own advantage and its own demerit. If you th see this basal bolus, it mimics the physiology. That is obviously the best thing. You will have a better control, but the patient, it is not that convenient. You will need multiple pricks. Also, the patient will have 
more hypos. Whereas basal, the best part is once daily injection, very simple, very less hypo and very easy to titrate. Whereas this premix is somewhere between these two. You will have some advantage of the basal, some advantage of the basal bolus and some demerits of the basal, like uh, you cannot too much up titrate above 0.5. You will have more nocturnal hypos and the PPs won't be much controlled with that. So premix fits somewhere between this and this is actually very easy, especially like most of our population who don't have access to super specialists. For them, it is really easy to initiate and up titrate the premix. Okay, so this is two in one solution. We know about this deglutec, we know about the spacer and we know all those things that there's a fatty acid chain and all those then the it's almost peakless. The half life is more than 24 hours and the spart we know that the B28 is changed, all those things, it's a short acting, very rapid, fast, all those things. But the important thing here that if you see, most of us actually initiate with a glargine, but that glargine cannot be co-formulated with the other insulin because of the pH, because of the acidic pH of the glargine. But here this degludec can actually be combined with aspart and given as a single injection. Okay, so here we can just escape all those sides, we are already running late. So if you'll see here, uh, the that prandial peak that would be controlled by the insulin as part whereas this degludec will act as a basal insulin and here you can initiate with a single prick or a twice a prick and most important thing is the convenience to the patient that he can change this also let's say i have a special like i have a dinner today at some of my friends place and usually i inject my insulin in afternoon so even i can switch that insulin from afternoon to night without taking that afternoon insulin so that flexibility is actually given by this that flexibility you cannot have with other premix so that is really important okay so this is about uh, study this is phase 3 trial from uh, Japan and here almost 300 patients insulin nave were taken 150 in both arm U100 glargin versus IDEC aspart 150 patients both you will see here that <coughs> the fasting was equally controlled actually that is how they titrated the insulin so I don't need to say that that the fasting was not different but important thing there was non-significant difference between these two between the hypos nocturnal hypos weight gain and total daily dose of insulin when you'll see the hba1c reduction it was higher in the idec part versus the basal insulin uh, that's glargin and also if you'll see the number of patient who got hbnc below seven percent it was only one in four for the u100 glargin and almost 50 percent for this idec part and here you will see in this uh, uh, I could not point it, but here you'll see that the postprandial drop was with IDEC as part. It was not there with the U100. Obviously, that's a basal insulin. And this diagram you must have seen many times that even with this, this CGMS thing going on and everybody putting CGMS, now you can see all those peaks and even those small peaks actually causes this reactive oxygen species to high up and it causes oxidative stress. And now we have all those data which shows that even with this time in range, we have correlation with very strong microvascular and some of the studies we have for macrovascular complication as well. Okay, so this is, and here you will see that the risk of hypo, though numerically different, lower for IDEC as part, but it was non-significant. So we'll say it's almost same, no difference in the hypos overall or nocturnal hypos also for the weight gain and the total daily dose. And here you have 72% patient achieved their target that's less than 7%, I've already told you, only 25% in the U100 arm, whereas 43% in the IDEC as part arm, okay? So this is all about, I've already told you. Okay, so this is very good. This is a smart study, real world evidence. That is a study of management of diabetes with rhizodec treatment. Here what they've done, they've taken this for a year. It's a prospective real world evidence, obviously an observational study, but a prospective study, single arm only on rhizodec. Patient were uh, evaluated at zero, three, six and 12 uh, months and almost 
thousand, more than thousand patients were taken with the mean duration of diabetes of around 10 years, with the mean age of around 55 years. This was the study with Rhizodec. And here you will see that the, uh, this is uh, the baseline, the patients who were already on insulin other than the this uh, IDEC as part were also included. So almost 27% were already on insulin and 73% were not on insulin. Here you'll see the HBNC fall was around 1 1.5 to 1.8% in all these patients. And the fasting drop around 50 and the PP drop was around 70 to 80. These are some post breakfast and post uh, lunch drops. And important thing, if you see for hypo event, because see, you are giving an insulin with a short acting and a long acting. So probably we feel that the patient will have more of hypos because now you have added a component of short acting. Okay, but what the study says, if you'll see here within first three months, there were almost like 176 events, but the patient were repeated. So 67 patients, that means only 6.7% of the patient had hypo, and that too only at their first three months. After that, they did not have hypos, and severe hypos were zero. That is more important. Severe hypo was zero after three months. So even after adding a prandial, a short-acting insulin, okay, your HbA1c is reducing, without increasing incidence of hypoglycemia. That is really important. Okay, this is again, I've told you the RSSDI ESI consensus 2019-2020. They said that uh, you can initiate with a premix and important thing, you can intensify or titrate with this single insulin twice. That you can do. That you cannot do with a basal insulin, obviously. So that is important. And this becomes very convenient for the patient to understand and also for the physician to up titrate. Okay, so this is all about this and okay, so this I've already discussed. So recommendation is if you are treating with this, you have to again monitor the fasting, something similar to a basal insulin. That is again what we do here. We take the average of the three readings or the lowest of the three readings and up titrate the, this premix IDEC as part. You have to give with a major meal and if you are giving twice, then the next meal, pre-meal, sugars, you have to see and accordingly you have to titrate because there's a component of short acting with this insulin. So this insulin can be given to those patients who have this PP rise. Actually, we see uh, fasting and PP difference also while we prescribe this insulin. Usually in general practice, we take somewhere around 50 as a cutoff, but there are studies which shows that less than 18, you have to give a basal. More than 54, you have to start with a prandial insulin as well. So in clinic practice, what we do is the 50 difference we see between pre and post. If there is more than this, actually this patient needs a prandial insulin. Or if the basal goes beyond 0.5, then definitely we have to initiate. But this you can directly initiate, right? So this is postprandial spike is also controlled. The patient who are on multiple OHS guidelines says if you, the patient is already on three OHS, it's useless to add a fourth OHA. So where the, in this these types of patients, you can give this flexibility in timing. The example I've just given you, that is the best thing with this insulin. And this cannot be done with the other insulins, okay? And reduced injection burden. That is the most important thing because since childhood, like it's imbibed in our brain, whenever the child goes to a doctor, if he do something, the parent will say, just keep quiet, otherwise the doctor will put in a needle. Right? You'll get an injection. So that fear of injection is instilled right from the beginning. So that is actually reduced, that overall burden, that is reduced with risk of hypoglycemia is decreased. Nocturnal hypoglycemia is also decreased, along with a better glycemic control. That is, again, very important. And this is my last slide. So this is actually the, I would say, most important. Whatever you do, if you don't educate your patient, best of best insulin will fail. That's the most important thing. You have to tell your patient about the dose, type, and syringe, 40, 100 technique, rotation, storage site, needle, times with meal, how to do it, how much to wait, how much to take, how to adjust, what are the sugars, how much to increase. So all those things are actually important. The most important thing is hypoglycemia that needs to be discussed not only with the patients who are on insulin, those patients who are on OHA as well should be discussed regarding hypoglycemia. So this is what I do. I made a YouTube video. I put it there. 
patient just need to type insulin education dr mayur and he'll get that video it's in regional language within 10 minutes we tell him everything regarding the insulin all those points <coughs> i have told here that we cover along with the types of insulin and what he has to do in hypo all those things including the glucagon so all those things this is actually the most important until unless you educate your patient the best of best insulin will fail okay so in summary we have this high carb diet so we have this high ppg insulin therapy had some limitation but adherence is the major problem most patient who have this actually when the sugars are controlled they go back to ohs and that is not what is uh, to be done okay so idk as part this is uh, this covers the fasting as well as the pp so that the oxidative stress decreases the time in range actually that is what we are targeting so that improves with this so thank you for your patient hearing any question is welcome